Okay. So uh, my name is Mariana Perala. I am from AT&T Mobility, and today I'm going to uh, talk to you about how to do service chaining using neutron networks implemented as, as Layer 3 VPNs. There, there's going to be no code, no demo. It's going to be kind of theoretical presentation, but it's going to be it's a, a reality now. So it's not something completely... Uh, it's, it's actually which is happening right now and, and, and is being used in, in production. So uh, outline of my talk is that I, I'm going to just remind what are the neutron plugin strategies because it kind of applies to my talk and yesterday there was a talk on Neutron 101 so I actually had some Neutron 101 in my talk but I removed it because <laughs> somebody covered it yesterday. Then I'm going to talk about uh, some networking limitation in, in, in default neutron of ES ML2, which actually, in my opinion, prevents doing, you know, really scalable service chaining. And then I'm going to talk to you about what are the service chaining requirements and then how MPLS BGP VPNs actually can, can implement uh, service chains. So, we are all familiar with uh, many networking technologies which are being developed or have been developed to address various cloud challenges like scaling, manageability, uh, fast deployment of applications. So I'm just listing here like three main ones, which is, you know, now it's pretty clear that to, uh, to do any scalable deployment of, of, uh, in cloud, uh, one has to use overlays networks. And typically, there are overlays over some scalable IP fabric solutions like closed design. The second is SDN, soft, software defined network, which basically provides uh, programmable forwarding uh, planes. And the third one is uh, the standard based routing technology, technologies today, which are implementing data center networks, overlay networks. And this is all actually possible because of how Neutron was designed. So Neutron architecture is actually very flexible and extensible, and mainly through its plugin mechanism and through its uh, API extensions that allow different technologies to be implemented. And so it allows for innovation. So there are actually two plugin, Neutron plugin strategies. One strategy is uh, to which actually ties to a, part, to a particular technology, but allows for advancing, for, for some advancing networking, advanced network, networking result in terms of scalability, manageability, or just features, all, 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 the, all of the above. Those plugins are called sometimes monolithic or standalone plugins, and they are not necessarily proprietary or vendor specific. They could be, there are now plugins which are open source, plugins which are monolithic. Then we, have, then we have another strategy when, which gives a, a lot of flexibility in terms that different technology can be used from different vendors, but the, but the result is the lowest common denominator result, which is VLAN or equivalent of VLAN. And this is module layer two plugin, which uh, allows, you know, which basically is an abstraction when vendors can plug in the device drivers and usually those drivers are proprietary drivers, uh, except maybe open daylight driver, which is, which is open source. So the ML2 networking or default or neutron OVS networking uh, has some key limitations. And, and I, I am listing those which kind of pertain to, to, network, to service chaining, and, but they are also true about in general networking with neutron. So routing is not a core Neutron feature. Routing is, is an extension, is a service plugin which is implemented as a Linux virtual server. So the switching is the core function, but the routing is not core function. And until it becomes a co core function, I think there will be a lot of com unnecessary complexity. Uh, second is that routing is limited to static routing right now. This is being addressed, right? Because dynamic routing is being introduced into Neutron However, it's still in the context on the, in the, of Linux virtual router, right? So the first problem is still not being addressed. And the third one is because of the fact that the routing is not a core feature, you know, the load balancing, ECMP load balancing is also not a core feature. 
and it is also problematic because, of course, there is low ba load balance as, as a service, but load balance as a service does not have infinite capacity, right? Eventually, you have to load balance to the load balancer, right? So, so you need some kind of a core load, balance, lo load balancing uh, functionality. And I kind of go one by one uh, of those limitations, and then, you know, hopefully I get to how to solve, how to resolve those limitations. So uh, I kind of say what is needed and why neutron, what, what neutron doesn't do, okay? So a new, default neutron, I mean. So uh, cloud applications require optimal and control, controlled connectivity, okay? So op optimal connectivity is basically that you would like to traverse from network to network without going through the middle virtual router, okay? And even with the DVR, with distributed virtual routing, you still, one still has to go, you know, the traffic still has to go through that router, right? It's switching and it's routing. It's not, it's the, the routing is not native. And, and you saw, I, I was in the talk yesterday, the DVR talk, and it's, it's implemented, but it's quite complex, okay? So but it's still the, the, the Linux appliance is still there as a router, and, and it's very complex to actually do east-west uh, routing. Uh, so, of course, another, another limitation associated with lack of core routing is that today cloud applications are deployed as, and managed as a service. So they would like to, you know, those services, or owners of the services would like to define uh, and control their access policies, okay? This is not possible today with do default neutron router because, because you can define the policy only from the exit of the client network, right? So it is an application or client of the, of the service, and when the policy is applied, is on the router at the exit of this network, right? So basically what it means that the application that the policy definition is, is equivalent to its implementation and and this is not what what is needed in in, in this is very limited a second is lack of dynamic routing this is a much more obvious right and i think that in general community a, a community agrees with this uh, limitation and it's being addressed you know typically it is explained as in terms of resiliency, right, that you, you lose, you lose a one path to external network, then if you have dynamic routing to external network, you can fail over. But also with lack of dynamic routing, it's very difficult to, uh, to extend the, the networks across data centers, or it's very difficult to, to preserve the, the virtual network co context across the WAN. So that's especially true for private clouds where, where enterprise customers already have virtual networks in the WAN or in, in the metro network and you would like to extend them into the data center. It's, it's difficult to do if you don't have dynamic routing. And, and the, third, the second piece of this lack of dynamic routing is that cloud tenants want to be able to dynamically plug in services between networks. And you will see I have more details about it, but you need really a dynamic routing to do that correctly and in a scalable manner and in automated manner, you need a dynamic routing. So default Neutron, you know, doesn't have dynamic routing uh, right now and there is no generic service insertion support uh, also. The third one, which I mentioned before, is third limitation is lack of integrated load balancing. So uh, network services, you know, which are deployed in virtual machines, uh, they require horizontal scaling, right? So the traffic has to be load balanced to those, you know, multiple instances. There could be 10 of hundreds of instances to which the traffic has to be balanced. So the notion of having integrated load balancing is, is, is crucial. Uh, so, so these limitations, you know, and solutions that are pretty obvious, right? So if you have only default gateway routing, it's not sufficient. You have to have fully distributed routing as we have today in neutron fully distributed switching. Uh, there is static routing, we need dynamic routing. No built-in load balancing, fully distributed load balancing. And actually, if you do the fully distributed routing correctly, then, then load balancing will come for free. And all those three uh, elements, aspects, actually are very important uh, capabilities which are needed to implement dynamic service insertion, also known as service chaining. And I just want to 
to quickly kind of show you, explain kind of what is service chaining and, and how it relates to, 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 to neutron. So service chaining is basically a form of network policy, right? So network policy defines connectivity, may define access control, and also insertion of network services. So service chaining is simply a form of network policy. There doesn't we need to reinvent a new construct for service chaining. It basically it's a network policy. And uh, operators, for example, I, I work for mobility, so things which we you know, want to do is that we, for example, this uh, little service chain, very simple service chain, represents uh, uh, so-called GI interface of 3GPP network when your data uh, call terminates on the P gateway, P gateway, packet gateway, mobility packet gateway, and then needs to be processed. And one of the processing example is port 80 traffic, HTTP traffic, which typically goes through ADC load balancer, then go through HTTP proxy, and then firewall NAT function, and then to the internet. So this is kind of the level of how operator would like to express the policy, and would like to get some magic that this policy is implemented in the, in the, in the OpenStack cluster. So, and that's where the OpenStack and Neutron, Neutron plugin come into the picture, because the service chains is composed of neutron networks. I'm just kind of drew a little picture how, you know, that here on the left hand side you have an abstract representation, on the right is kind of the implementation of it. So we have some kind of overlay networks which are stitched together in such a way that the traffic from the source, which is a network attached to the P gateway and the network attached to the internet, that is external get, uh, network, is adjusted in such a way that the traffic goes through those service uh, appliances. And, you know, so it's, we translate and program such that this happens in, in, in the actual net physical network. So it will go from what to how. Now, why, why routing and dynamic routing and distributed routing is so important for service chaining? So here I, I am showing a very simple example that we have two service chains, right? So we go from network A to B, the traffic flows through appliances as one, as two, and as three, and they may be on multiple instances, and uh, which I'm showing, you know, some have two, some have three, you know, could be tens, two, could be hundreds. And then on the other service chain, we have something else, maybe different appliances and only two of them. So, so basically, um, the, the point of service chaining is that it has to be a way to communicate. It, it, it clearly, in network A, network A has to know how to get to the prefix, prefixes in network B. So, uh, and the same, you know, to the net, network C. And network B or network C could be tenant networks, so they could be simply attached to some VMs, or they could have, or, or maybe some prefixes are injected through those networks. So, for example, network B could be a network attached to internet and it's learning some prefixes from internet. Maybe network C is attached to uh, some VPN in the, in the WAN, right? And it's learning some prefixes through, through this network. Oh, but it could be also that network B is simply a bunch of VMs sitting on this particular subnet. Very often, like for example in mobility, uh, the mobile pool are not addressed of the P gateway. Mobile pool are sitting on the P gateway, and they somehow have to be injected into the OpenStack routing uh, system. So, so there is definitely routes which need to flow, float from, from ingress to egress and vice versa. So in this particular case, network A has to know uh, the prefix to network B, and somehow those, those routing of those prefix, prefixes, in this case 20.0.0 slash 24, has to be such that the traffic is flowing through this particular chain. The same for network 30, that the, the routing has to be adjusted in such a way that when you leave the network A, the traffic is attracted to the lower chain, and when it leaves the, the chain, it actually can be forwarded, forwarded to this destination 30.0.0.5. So this is what means the in, in, in to integrate the service chaining with routing. It's without integration, the, this cannot happen automatically, right? You are not going to go around and configure some static routes everywhere. It's simply not possible because new prefixes are injected all the time, right? So it, it is a dynamic, dynamic scenario. 
so that's, uh, ser that's service chain itself. Now the second one is the virtual appliances with build uh, in load balancing. So here we have situation when services are deployed in multiple instances, multiple VMs. So for example, service one has two VMs, service two has four, maybe services has three VMs. And um, to scale horizontally automatically that way, we have to have load balancing at each hop of that chain, right? So that has to be load balancing at the compute host at the source network, which is network A, and then at each network which connects uh, consecutive hops, right? Because imagine if you would like to do load balancing just from the source network, the number of combinations you have here is, is just combinatorial. You cannot do that with, with uh, with embedded load balancing in the, in the product. And of course, load balancing has some additional requirements which are basically flow-based because uh, to preserve traffic uh, flow in case of the instance failure, the load balancing have to be flow-aware. Flow and also for uh, appliances which are stateful such, like such as firewall, the load, uh, the lo flow base have to be symmetric, right? So we, the, the, the solution has to preserve flows both directions because of the state. Um, the third thing which I wanted to mention is that what is connected with load balancing is so-called high availability aware load balancing. So very often appliances are running their own high availability protocols on some private network. So in this particular case, I chose you know, this second service, service two, which has four insta instances, it sits on some private network, HA network, and is sending some health checks. You know, those instances are sending health checks to each other, usually the application level health checks. And then if one of them fails, they, you know, one of the other instances takes over, you know, the fail one. And somehow that information has to be communicated to the network, to the to the network which sits in the front of it, which is network C in this case, right? So for example, if the instance four fails here, somehow it has to be communicated to the, communicated to the network C not to send the traffic to, the, to that instance anymore. And this has to happen dynamically. So, uh, so that particular instance has to be removed from the ECMP set at the network C. Right, and this is also have to this also has to be done through routing because it's a dynamic event. So, I kind of show you three limitations of of current default neutron of ES ML2, and also how to solve them. And you can see that basically how to solve them is to implement implement fully distributed routing uh, as a, as a core fu neutron function as today switching is. And, and then load balancing will come for free. Uh, and, and also, you know, the, the, the dynamic routing also is something which, you know, we, it's, it's already happening in Neutron. So actually there is already a, a technology which does those things and it is called MPLS BGP VPNs. It's technology which exists for quite, a, for quite some time. So it's very well tested, it scales very well and it can address all those challenges of service in insertion and, and, so, and just networking as such in, in, in uh, OpenStack, uh, within the OpenStack cluster, beyond the OpenStack cluster, across open, OpenStack clusters. And obviously, you know, reusing something which is already there and is used is, is, much, easy, is much easier, more effective, economical than defining new protocols, which takes time and, and effort and also, you know, they have to be tested. It takes a long time. So, so standards don't mandate, mandate implementation, right? So it's only the message format which, which needs to be uh, uh, met. And so here I'm just showing how you do service training with MPLS VPNs. So uh, MPLS VPN has this notion of a virtual network uh, uh, routing and forwarding instance or table which uh, is used for networking, but the same mechanism can be used for the service chaining. So it gives you immediate integration with, uh, with routing. And how it is done is that we have this, in example, we have these two service chains I showed you before, and we have those VRFs, which are basically distributed routing tables, and they sit at the tenant network, so the ingress network on the left and the egress network on the right, and also at the service instances. 
So when the prefixes are inject injected, then the reachability is automatically, should be automatically adjusted so the traffic is forced to go into the particular instances in a particular order. And uh, BGP and PLS VPNs, they have three kind of um, building blocks to do that. It's notion of route target, which is basically define the isolation. The next hop self basically changes the next hop. It means, you know, come to me. Don't go directly from right to left, but go to me. And then label tells you which particular instance the traffic has to be forwarded to, right? So if you reach the service VRF on the compute, you have to have a label to tell you go to, you know, the first green box, right? Not the second one. So the label, you know, does that for you. So, so basically this flow is the control plane flow, right? So the traffic will flow from left to right, but the control plane goes from right to left. The same, so that's for top service chain. Then we have the same situation for the a lower chain, and then traffic steering is simply an ACL, which is applied at the ingress, not at the egress of the network, right? So as I mentioned to, to you before, the neutron, default neutron does not allow you to do things at ingress. You have to do things at egress, and, and it breaks a lot of things. So, so here ACL is, is at the ingress, and now we have traffic flowing, you know, this way, and some other traffic flowing this way. So maybe ACL, you know, has a rule that say port 80 traffic goes at the top chain and the non-port 80 goes at the bottom chain. And then we also have places when we insert load balancing, which is basically at the places when we have a scale-out services. So at the scale-out is the green S2 service, so the load balancing is applied at the VRF at the previous hop, right? The same for the lower chain when the load balancing is applied at the at the VRF instance before the, the uh, scale-out service five. And then integration with HA is that it's applied at the, pl at the places when we have scale-out services, right? So basically, if there is any failure, then the VRF is informed of this failure and then pro can pro propagate this information uh, to the upstream hop, such that the upstream hop can remove the failed VM from the, from the load balancing set. So basically, these are the building blocks. It's VRF, it's ACL, it's BGP multipath, right? Which will do service training for you uh, immediately. You don't have to reinvent anything. So applicability to a VPN is obvious. I mean, I'm just listing some, uh, you know, properties of MPLS BGP VPNs, which you can see will be very useful in, in, the, in Neutron, right? So its, it's definition of VPNs is based on, on, on its policy base by definition. Its virtual interface may be a member of different VPNs, this extranet construct. Its support for traffic filtering, its BGP flow spec. They're all standards, by the way. Uh, there, there is a proven scale, so deployment with many millions of routes are common. You know, it's like we in our network have multiple uh, millions of routes and we don't have any scaling problems. Uh, there is optimal route distribution, so the routes don't go to all the compute, you know, I mean to, yes, all the compute or VRFs don't see all the routes, only see the routes which they need to see and it's done by the standard called BGP route constraint and uh, support for scalable multicast, and there is multi-vendor interoperability for, for at least 10 years. So the question to ask is why not to use this technology as a back-end technology for modular layer 3 plugin, right? So this seems to be <laughs> kind of low-hanging fruit which, which, uh, which could be used and is used, uh, but it is not a part of the core neutron, right? So, uh, it's, it's being deployed, but not as a part of core neutron. And here I'm li I want to list some of the standards and open source projects which, uh, are, you know, which define or use MPLS BGP VPN. So it's, you know, two RFCs, which, you know, are the base. Then there is ITF uh, draft, which extends that notion to the end system, meaning to the compute. Then there is a a draft which kind of describes, you know, I, I'm co-authored co this draft. It's, it's an informational draft in ITF which defines, you know, which describes what I kind of explain here, how the service is, is done. And, and of course, there's OpenStack, it's Neutron, and then there is one open source implementation 
of, of this technology, which is open contrail, which is compatible with uh, version two of Neutron API, uh, but it needs, of course, API extensions uh, to implement this technology today. So this is, I think I am finished. I think it was pretty fast. <laughs> yes, please. No, no. The BGP does not does not go to compute at all. The BGP, yes. The question was whether the BGP has to go to VNFs. You know, I mean, BGP doesn't even have to go to compute, but it doesn't go to VNFs for sure. Yes. Yeah, because that's a pictorial view, right? So I'm I'm showing here the, the, the how the traffic flows, right? It's, a, but how, if you can see here, okay, maybe I go here, you see, it, it goes only, the, the control plane is only touching the VRFs. You see, n n the control plane does not go to the, to the VNFs. You see those lines here, I, I don't have a pointer, but if you see the lines RT plus next hop self plus, plus label, they are exchanged between the, the VRFs, which are running on the compute nodes, right? It's, you can imagine it's like they are replacing OVS, right? So VRF, imagine, is like OVS, right? And, and so the information does not go to VNFs. VNFs know nothing about this technology at all. Not necessarily. That's not how it is implemented today. The B B BGP is, is only in the control, in the central controller, and, and you don't have to run BGP down to the compute. So for example, OpenContrail is using XMPP, but it can be other protocol. It doesn't have to be XMPP. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, what is available for public in, in inspection, I think it's, yes, it's, it's here, right? This is not implementation, this is good. Yes, I mean, the implementation, you know, we have our own internal implementations which we are working on, right? And, and uh, this is not, yeah, you know, it, it will be for public use, right? Because we are be building the cloud uh, based on some of these technologies. I mean, then you go to. Yes, I mean, I, I don't know if somebody, maybe somebody implemented open, um, open source. No, we have not imp implemented the. the uh, no. <laughs> With the VR, uh, no, yeah, I mean, it kind of replaces the DVR, right? It's, it doesn't. Uh, DVR is still based on the Linux namespaces. This is not. This replaces the OVS Linux bridge, right? It's. Uh, if I use DVR to distribute my daughter, then the the third team yeah. can still work. Not in this way. I don't know how the service chain will work with DBR. I mean, somebody would have to demonstrate it. I don't know how, how it will, because it still have the issue that, that DBR router is shared. It's not a private router. It's, it's a shared router between different virtual network, right? So where would you apply the policy? I don't know, at the exit of the, of the, of the network, so. Hey, Maria, Oop, just a, we can mm -hmm. use a mic here too, guys. Um, just a, one question, are you at all looking at NSH header technology now? Some of the announcements have just recently come out. Yeah, so you know, so the difference, yeah, it's a good question. The difference between this and NSH header is that this doesn't require a change in the NFE, right? So uh, NSH, NSH header will have to be understood by, the, by those services, right? right? And this is complicated thing, right? I don't know if I don't know if you have, know of any services who understand. Maybe there are some, but you need it everywhere. Second issue is that I don't know how this and how how NSH is signaled, 
Okay, okay. There is, there's talk about signaling, but how actually the signal is not clear. So, so this, 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 there is an issue that you would like, you may include a metadata right. in it's, the it's, packet. It's in the, it's in the header, right? So yes, but, uh, but it's better to do it with the IP header than, okay. than some new header, which will introduce another complication. <laughs> In your solution, what would you advocate to uh, associate the VPN with the neutron router construct or associate it with the network, neutron network, or uh, what do you, what do you uh, suggest advocate in your solution? Yes, yeah, so what, what I'm suggesting is that to use the fully distributed routing, right? So they replace the Linux bridge or VS with fully distributed router, not to add a router as a service, right? But to have the routing function as a core part of the of Neutron, it will simplify a lot of things. It will help. You know, there is an um, effort, I believe, in OpenStack, which is group based policy a project, right? And and how? Yes, it's great to have policy, but how it's going to be implemented with default Neutron? It's not clear, right? Uh, but with this kind of technology, you can, you can implement it very easily. Uh, so, so that technology basically does for you routing and switching if you want, and does uh, you know, network policy uh, implementation very, you know, in very clear and, and clean way. Okay. Is, isn't OVN trying to do that? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so OVN is kind of an example, you know, I guess a proof that that maybe the OVS has to improve, right? So <laughs> so maybe it's a suggestion, right? That's why that's what I said here that maybe okay, I have to go through all the ticks. Okay, then maybe that's maybe that's OVN. That's how OVN should look like. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, I think no more questions. Thank you.